just important historical question uh, that, that somebody asked about, which I think it's worth sharing with everybody. It really was the question, well, why, if this was such a, obviously geared to grade school, why did the brothers leave the grade schools? The brothers never left the grade schools of their own volition. The brothers were asked to leave the grade schools and develop more high schools. It's as simple as this. If you go back to the 1870s, 1880s, there were, I think, between New York and Philadelphia alone, a couple of hundred grade schools of the brothers. And what happened? Well, the bishop said, look, there are, there's no high schools. You've got to take these schools on and make high schools out of them as well. And at the end of the high schools, they said, listen, there's no, there's no colleges. There are, this is the whole member, know-nothing period in the States, a very nasty period of anti-Catholicism in your history. So that's why Manhattan begins with engineering. Catholic engineering. Yes. That's why Moraga, California, begins a few years later. Then I think, what next? Was it uh, probably La Salle, Philadelphia, or Memphis? Anyhow, but the whole development of the high school and the college came at the express direction of the bishops. That just as you've started these grade schools, and we now need high schools, etc. And it was very particularly, of course, in the 20th century that uh, as um, congregations in the 1950s, there were lots more congregations of sisters and so on like that, that very often the brothers were asked to, well, give the grade school over or the brothers, we don't need you in the grade school, the sisters will do that, etc. And, and that was the case in my own country too. I, I went uh, right through grade school with the brothers taught only by brothers, through secondary school, taught only by the brothers. Uh, but now we have, no, we have no grade schools for the same reason. And indeed, like you, we have a whole problem of the lack of men teaching in grade schools. And that would be across the, across the whole spectrum, not just across Catholic schools. Uh, at a time, you know, when marriage break down and things like this, often young people growing up without any male figure with any form of authority. Anyhow, it was an important question, and that's an historical question. We're going to look very quickly at um, what this method meant in practice, and I'm just going to run through this very quickly. We looked at it already, uh, etc. This is an important one. Some of the schools of the time, uh, we know, for example, from a, a con document contemporary with the brothers at this period in, fra in Paris, that um, you have to make sure that the rich or the better off kids are not asked to sit next to kids who are very poor. I mean, not that, not that anybody bathed very much in France in those days. It was regarded as highly dangerous. You might get a cold if you bathed. Um, you rubbed a uh, you know, face with an oil rag. That's how Louis XIV did it anyhow. So, I mean, it was a pretty smelly kind of society. But anyhow, uh, but the kid in, you know, cut down clothes compared with the kid who was better off, the, the other schools at the time said you must sit the better off kids together, not too close to the ones who are. The LaSalle schools, you took places according to the last monthly test. It was always that way. The... Brothers task every evening, at equivalently we'd say nowadays terms, probably between 8.45 and 9 o'clock at night time in the brothers' community room. They'd been working, that a bell had been rung to indicate it was time now to prepare your catechism lesson for tomorrow. And if you were a young brother, young being a relative term, but it would have meant if you were, hadn't made your final profession, what you did on this, at this, at 8.45 in the evening, you took to the director the questions you were going to treat from the catechism and the sub-questions you were going to ask. And the director would look at them and say, well, have you thought about, da -da, what about, perhaps you should add in, da-da-da-da-da. That was every night. This lesson was very important and that's what you did in, pre in preparing for it the following day questions and sub-questions which were always about meaning 
let there be understanding long before you ask for any kind of memorization. You find in the conduct of schools, they had cards given out, positive points, uh, etc., etc. They're all little helps to people who answered successfully, might get a holy card or something like that, or they might get uh, so many merits entitling them, you know, to. Uh, um, I'm not quite sure what they did in those days, but perhaps being let off some punishment or something that they committed a fault for. Um, there was never any punishment. You must never punish during the religion lesson. And it's interesting, I've given you a footnote which is quite fascinating, contemporary footnote of the essential piece of the time saying, look, look, you know, as far as possible, don't reach over the desk and take kids and shake them and say, shut up. <laughs> That's not in the brother's rule. This is in Sansal Peace. You know, you, and you mustn't hit them around the ears, says Sansal Peace. The brother's thing is never touch them in that sense. So, yes, you don't, etc. Now, if the thing is serious, you might save it up for the next day and say, now listen, what you said yesterday afternoon, that was wrong. Remember what you said? And why do you think it was wrong? Correction is more important than punishment. This was the whole emphasis. So that when the conduct of schools is written as a text, is printed, the main chapter becomes a chapter not on punishment, but the longest chapter is on correction. Correction? Yes. Correction so that the arithmetic answer is correct. Correction so that you don't say that word like that, you pronounce it this way. Say it again for me. Correction so that that word that you've written or the way that you've written that, no, no, that's not. You've got to redo that because you don't make that letter that way. You must make it that. Correction, 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 not punishment. The, cooperative, the, the whole cooperative aspect of the Christian school is extraordinary. It was not competitive. Jesuits had a very competitive method which they used, often based on Roman centurions and, uh, you know, etc., etc., and it worked very well. The Lasallian method was cooperative. Those who, who knew more helped the others. The whole idea was everyone had to go through the monthly test and succeed, get promoted at the end of the year. Cooperative learning. Sit the clever kid next to the kid who's not so good. Help one another. Before school starts, you can come in before the school begins and you're allowed to sit with somebody if they need help and you help them with their work or so on like that. And, as Erna said, the, brothers, the catechism lesson was the brother's principal duty and he was to accomplish it every day. It comes up, I've given you a number of texts in the text that you'll receive uh, where he just reminds them, it's every day. That's where you show your faith with the young people every day. Okay. Now, Joseph Colomb was one of the great architects of the post-war catechetical movement. He was a Sulpician. He did the most important, wrote a number of very important books. He was the founder of the catechetical institute associated with the Catholic Institute in Paris where I did a lot of my own studies and reading and so on like that. And uh, Cologne was eventually condemned uh, by Rome. When I say by Rome, by certain people in Rome. Not by his own bishops. Not by the own Cardinal Archbishop. But uh, he had to be replaced as head of that school and eventually founded another similar school in Strasbourg. A great man. He was a Sulpician and he's writing about the matter of San Sulpice. And notice what he says. Teaching the heart is indisputably the essential purpose of the, of the method. In a word, this is necessary, it is necessary to begin by winning hearts and then all is won. Now, teaching the heart. We're going to look at a number of expressions with regard to the, with regard to the heart. This is the great century of the heart. Story of Margaret Mary Alacoque. Devotion to the Sacred Heart, the Nine First Fridays, are all contemporary with de La Salle, who never mentions them.
because it's associated with the Jesuits. Now, it's not because it's to say just that at this time the Jesuits are going through a bad period. At least they're tied up politically. Certain Jesuits have been tied up so politically with trying to work through and have a particular influence. The confessor to Louis XIV is a Jesuit, which makes everybody very suspect and so on like that. So even though contemporary with de La Salle, he never mentions this. But everybody else who's writing in this period does. And it's interesting to see, for example, St. John Eude, founder of the Congregation of Jesus and Mary, whom we have in this country, who writes, the 17th century French spirituality is centred on the heart. And, and Eude says, it signifies this material and bodily heart used in sacred scriptures to signify the memory, it's the understanding used for meditation, it's the free will of the superior and reasonable part of the soul, it's the highest part of the soul, which theologians call the point of the spirit, it's the whole interior of human beings, it means the divine spirit, the heart of the Father and the Son. Now this is a very important concept that goes not only through French spirituality, it goes through also German Lutheranism about the same time. And if you, any of you know the cantatas of Johann Sebastian Bach, then quite a number of his cantatas, not the text that he wrote, but the text which he set to music, are about the heart. As a matter of fact, some of them, when you translate them, they sound so maudlin, and so they, they translate literally into such soupy English, but in the original German, they're quite strong. And uh, um, the tune we know as Jesus, Joy of Man Desiring, etc., comes out of a cantata which is about the heart and the mouth, about the heart and the mouth that proclaims what the heart says. So, so there's a lot of thing about the heart. And therefore, John Baptist de La Salle uses the expression very often, touching hearts. We hear it very frequently. And sometimes I wince when I hear people using it as those, oh, we, don't, we, we just touch their hearts. No, we train their minds as well, I hope. <laughs> it's not a soupy sentimental thing at all. And it's not as though we're very clever, actually. We've studied how to touch their hearts. No, no. In his meditations, de La Salle will say, say, for the Feast of Pentecost, Feast of Pentecost, yes, Feast of Pentecost, birthday of the church, today you must pray for the grace to touch hearts. It's the grace of your state. But you can't do this without the help of the Holy Spirit. Beseech the Holy Spirit today to help you, etc. It's not a technique. It's the grace you pray for that the faith you bring will resonate with the faith or the doubt or the uncertainty of the young people with whom you deal. It's faith speaking to faith to doubt, heart speaking to heart. Very, very important concept. And Goussaint, great French uh, brother, anthropologist, says to touch in the most expressive sense of the word does not only signify to reach, to graze, to make contact, but to penetrate in accordance with its use when dealing with weapons. I've given you this text, by the way. Hence the power of the figure of speech when one refers to the moral sphere. As for the word heart, it stands for what is most intimate, most deep and most personal, especially in whatever concerns the will, the intention, the resolution, and the going into action. Okay. Goussaint goes on to tell us, uses the expression to touch hearts 25 times. On another 12 occasions, he uses the expression where only the verb to touch figures within an identical meaning. We note that it's always in an important context related to the finality of the Institute and the Lasallian charism. In other words, why the Institute exists, and what the particular grace is. The more you will apply yourself to meditation for the good of the souls entrusted to you, the more God will make it easier for you to touch hearts. In other words, what is your meditation destined for? It's very much like the Dominican motto, 
which says, what you have contemplated, hand on to others. Contemplate tradere aliis. What you've contemplated, share with others. Mm. That's a very deep sense of it. So that if you touch hearts, it's not because, oh, I'm very shrewd, I know, I know how to get at them. No, it's rather, how do you bring something in the very way you teach, etc., that they hear themselves being spoken at, where heart is indeed speaking to heart. And we're, of course, given the splendid inability of adolescents to formulate this, except in terms of grunts and groans. You mightn't necessarily see the result. But that's what you're trying to do. And what's interesting is De La Salle uses different verbs. And I, I think it may be an unconscious appreciation of the different pastoral situations that the Lasallian educator may encounter. For example, he says, you are obliged to insinuate his love into the heart of those whom you instruct. And you should apply yourself to the greatest care to imprint holy love, God's holy love, on those whom you instruct. It's interesting, he says, he, used, he says to win hearts, to touch hearts, one stage, he says, to conquer hearts. Let's think about that for a moment. Why? Why those different verbs? What did you think of to win hearts? What does that suggest? Winning somebody over. What does it imply? It's a battle. Sorry? It's a battle. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. In other words, there's a bit of resistance going on, isn't there? You've got to win them. You've got to win them in some way. In other words, you won't necessarily find them all eager. Oh, speak to us. <laughs> I'm sure you don't find that out. You've got to win them over. Conquer hearts. What does that suggest? Resistance. <laughs> resistance, isn't it? Isn't it fascinating when you think of De La Salle and the work in Rouen? Since young, the boarders initially, then the delinquents, then the prisoners, the ones committed indefinitely, <coughs> who lived in those dungeons of St. Yon. I don't know how many of you have seen the, the set of videos I did for George Van Grieken, but they're available now from the office, I think, aren't they? For our district, our office has provided, or is in the process of providing, one of those copies to everyone. Okay. So there's a few we haven't got to, right? But almost every one of our students has. Okay, right. So, I mean, what you'll see, yes. <coughs> when we refer to conquering and winning, doesn't it go against the idea of free will and accepting this freely as opposed to being almost like you're sub succumbing to it? What would you think? I, I think it, it, it suggests more of a relationship mm -hmm. and that winning and conquering might suggest some of that battle, whatever resistance, but that in any relationship there's tension, you know, whether that's a, a parent-child relationship or a husband-wife relationship or friend, you don't always get along. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it suggests that we have to be in it together. Mm -hmm. it to be Certainly you get resistance situations, don't you? Like it, it may be it may be the kid you're not getting along with or it doesn't appear to be and you sort of say anything wrong. No, no, no. But you go back next day and say, how are things going? It seems to me you're not trying to dominate. You're trying to establish a relationship where things will be a bit better. I think it's in that sense. I certainly would agree with you if it meant, well, you know, we know what it is and we're going to make them. No, it's not that. It's never that. Can't okay. be that. So, yes, good observation. Brothers. Yes. It's very, it's very incarnational, too. I mean, Jesus was a missionary that came down to make us living. He takes dead people, sinful people like us, and makes us living. He invites us. He doesn't uh, force us, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So he wins us over, too. Mm -hmm. Like in any invitation, if somebody gives you an invitation, I hope it's given in the sense that you could say yes or no to it. If they invite you and you say, oh, no, look, I can't come. Oh, well... They haven't really invited you, have they? <laughs> Invitations always mean yes or no. But if somebody invites you, or you invite the kid this day and it doesn't work, it doesn't stop you coming back the next day. How are things going? Is that any better? 
you can always invite. It's respectable. That it is important not to bring the Monty Python foot down and simply squash. <laughs> Will you get to something? Yes. It implies a trust. Kids yes. generally that most of the time, and then they open up and know that you're going to respect their ideas and thoughts. That's right. It's trust, isn't it? And trust is has to be mutual, hasn't it? It's a very interesting. And you, you always have the things that you never know about. Uh, I inherited a boy once in year 12. Well, I, I met him early because uh, uh, refereeing football matches, and he was a good little footballer. He was very, very small compared to the others. Whenever he was tackled with the ball, he would bite, scratch, and kick. <laughs> so, having seen it a couple of this particular time, I actually lifted him up by one hand and said to him, "It's only a game. We're playing a game. It's not life and death." Which is him. Well, one dreadful day, I walked into my year 12 classroom the first day, and he was sitting in the front seat. <laughs> and literally, I mean, I got such a shock, I said, what are you doing here? And, I mean, dreadfully wrong on my part, I said. <laughs> <laughs> I really was spontaneous. And, oh, I said, I passed my exams, I got the right to be here. <laughs> 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 As we set up the class for the week, he was going to be every class I taught. He was in my religion class, he was in my literature class, he was in my history class. <laughs> yes, well, we were not good friends. <laughs> so at the end of the first week, I thought, OK. So I said, Joe, just stay back to me after class. Listen, we, we haven't had a good start, I said, but we're going to be together the whole year. So listen, let's start again. Look. I'm Brother Jared, and I'm going to teach literature and history and so on like that, and we're going to get a great result, and you're going to get to university. I mean, I knew his mother ran a stall down the market. The father had cleared out years before. I knew all that about him. I don't know whether he knew that I knew, but that didn't matter. So I said, let's start again. And you're Joe, are you okay? Wel welcome. Let's have a great year together. And he looked at me and said, we'll see. <laughs> okay. But you see, there came the day when we debated, was the final of the under-21 debating competition open to all, and we beat, we beat a university team, and then we had to debate the final in the local jail. Yes, because they were the other finalists. <laughs> so we had to get counted into the jail, and all signed in, etc., and we were sitting in, with a nice big wire screen between us and the inmates, and so on like that. Uh, anyhow, and we were welcomed by the one presiding at the debate and said, I hope the boys from De La Salle feel comfortable because one of your former students will be debating against you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was one of the best too, I might tell you that bit. But anyhow, but we won the debate. Now, it was the first time any of these kids had been inside a jail. Uh, I mean, they were 17, 18 year olds. So when you came back the next morning, the whole class was a buzz. Those who had been to the debate, those who hadn't been to the debate. So it was just so, we didn't even, we just, people just talked. So at a certain stage I said, all right, okay, marvellous. We've got a lot more to talk about. But anyhow, we've got to get on with the lesson today. And Joe in the front seat, with his head on his arms, looked up and said, because I used to always start each day with the reflection, isn't there going to be a pep talk today? <laughs> Well, it, it floored me to think he was waiting for me to give the pep talk. I gave it every day. What was wrong with today? Why wasn't I giving it today? So something was happening. Interesting, the end of the year, he'd had a brilliant year. and Today he's a leading barrister in the city of Melbourne. Um, and um, I keep on getting these invitations through other people saying, you know, Joe wants to meet you and have coffee and all that, et cetera, all that. Now, I, I, just, I just give this as an instance where sometimes it takes, I think it took the best part of a year for us to be more, that we, we became civil to one another, but we eventually developed a very strong personal relationship. But it, it didn't happen all in one go, and it wasn't because I was very clever and knew how to touch hearts. It was relationship. It was the willingness for me to step down and acknowledge I'd done something quite unprofessional and unpardonable, and we started again. So it's a very key concept, I think, for us. And that's where his use of the word, and I really 
feel very bad sometimes when I read something uh, or hear somebody discoursing on touching hearts as though the brothers ran around saying, hello, Clive, hello, pretty sky, hello, touch hearts. It's, it's teaching minds and touching hearts. And it's the touching hearts sometimes through the teaching minds. The kind of aha moment when a kid sees something for the first time. It's a strong thing, not a weak thing. I, I think in, in, my, in, our, in our classrooms when we're working with religious studies, because we're, we're um, charged with the uh, touching our heart, we as, as adults or as teachers are more vulnerable than we are teachers. Oh. And we have to live in that vulnerability. We have to be considered fools by some of, the, of our students. Hmm. Um, and then keep on going to Very, very important observation. Very important. It really brings us to what most of this session is going to be about, which is really the reflection. The reflection begins with de La Salle and the First Brothers. And it was interesting. It was aimed at touching hearts. And it became an integral part of the La Salle and catechetical heritage. And if, if in this presentation this time, it makes you think about it uh, in another way or a deeper way, uh, then I'll be very, very happy indeed. Conduct of school says, the teacher will speak only aloud on three occasions. First, when he has to correct a pupil, because none of the pupils can do so. He might be correct a word or something. Second, when he teaches catechism. Third, during the reflections and examination of conscience. This is the only other time when he speaks. So, there were, from the very first schools, we can't say when. Did they do it in Reims? We don't know. They certainly did it in Paris. So, were they in the first school in 1680? We don't know. Certainly, by the 1690s in Paris, they're using the reflection. And there were original, there were only five of them. And it's interesting because... The reflections in La Salle and Literature are preceded by the remark to place ourselves in frame of mind, not to fall into any sin today, we must make some reflections and good resolutions. Isn't it interesting that we go straight away back to the negative falling into sin thing? This is how the whole thing starts. And so there are five reflections. And they were the only five initially. And look at them. The prayer reader read them out, there's a period of silence, and then the brother reflected on what that meant for three minutes. The text says the, the length of the uh, miserere, Psalm 50, have mercy on me God, etc. We must consider that this day has been given to us only to work for our salvation. Okay? We must realise perhaps this day will be the last day of our lives. So you've got eight... <laughs> You've got eight-year-olds sitting in front of you. Okay. Mind you, the funeral bell's going to toll quite frequently. If any of you have seen the, ch the school of saint Maclou in Rouen, this is right beside a burial ground. It's actually, the school is there and the burial ground is outside the school. They must have stopped many times during the day for, to pray for the person going past. We must make firm resolution to use this day to serve God well so that we gain, can gain eternal life. We must be prepared to die rather than offend God today through sin. We must think about the faults that we must usually commit, foresee the occasions that make us fall into them and seek the means of avoiding them. Wow. Lugubrious. Life is serious. Life is short. And for the best part of, we don't know how many years, we know in terms of what's written down, possibly the best part of a hundred years, these are the same reflections. 
depending on the feast day in the week, the first day of class, you get that way. You always start with that one. If the feast was Monday, well, you did it on Tuesday. But they were the five. Hmm. So the brother was to reflect on those. They were going to hear the same reflection, or well, this reflection on that done again and again. Now let's just think of a few aspects. Who were these kids? They lived in lovely homes with the two garage. No, no, no. They, we talk about Paris. They lived in a single room, most of them. There was a bed in the room. The parents were in one end and the kids in the other. There's no indoor toilet. There's a dung heap out the back. Water had to be carried into the house, etc. What was the age expectancy of a woman in Paris in the 1690s? About 30, 31. Something like, they estimate, three to four women in every ten died in childbirth. What was the age for men? About mid-thirties. Why? Because Louis XIV, in all his years as king, had peace only for three years. Not three years continuously, but in a period of three years. Louis fought everybody, north, south, east and west. Where did he get his soldiers from? When you needed more people, you went out with the press gangs and you simply took them. They weren't volunteers. So life expectancy was not very great. Just think of the conditions of living in those things. In 1709-1710, in Paris, those of you who have been to Paris and seen the River Seine, that great noble river, the Seine froze from bank to bank for three months. No river traffic, no movement. Three million people out of 19 people, ni ni 3 million out of 19 million in France died in that period of 1709-1710. The great famine of 1683-84 in Reims where de La Salle gives his goods away. We don't know what the figures were but we know they were very, very high also. What did people die of? They died of malnutrition and of the cold. That's what they died of. Life expectancy was not very great. So we'd look at this and think, oh, goodness me, you know. Oh, fancy talking about all those dreadful things. Well, we tend to be, in our society today, very euphemistic. We don't like the word death. Talk about people passing on, like you pass on a parcel or something. I'm not sure what... Or the deer departed. Um... The actual thing is they died, actually. They suffered death, and actually they were buried. <gasps> oh, my God, Father, don't say that. You spoil the children. No, that was the reality of life. And that's, but that's how it started. Now, what's interesting about all this, however lugubrious they sound, is, well, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make the point. I thought I'd, but it's in your text anyhow. We now know that those five things came from a catechism called the Catechism of Montpellier, which existed at the time. And we know that it was written by a Jansenist. And de La Salle, who was so anti-Jansenist, how did these things creep in? We don't know. Or did they both, did the Catechism of Montpellier, and they, did they come from another common source? We still don't know. What we do know is that almost in the very words that de La Salle uses, you do find the same thing in that catechism. And it was a Jansenist catechism. And about, uh, de La Salle dies 1719. In 1740, in a general chapter, the brothers are told to take out the catechism of Montpellier from their, if it's in their communities, and destroy it. It shouldn't be there. So somewhere along the line, they advert to the fact that it's... Um, hmm. Do they then get rid of the reflection? No. But what happens then? Well, we then get a, 
interesting link between the reflection itself. Reflection comes at the end of the morning, not when school begins, but as morning class finishes, books are cleared off the desk, the boy reads the reflection topic for the day, the brother gives it, and then the boys either go to Mass or in Central Peace, they would have gone off to what's called the soup of Central Peace because there was some kind of soup given to the poor. If they were poor, they were allowed to have soup. It was just a question, I suppose, that kept them alive anyhow. So de La Salle has a clear idea that between this reflection, which ends the morning, and the examination of conscience, which he does in the afternoon, was largely to investigate what the point of reflection was in the morning. So if it was read, must be careful not to sin today. Let's reflect then, okay, what's happened today? You know, what's been today? Have it, if you haven't, be sorry about it, and da 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 da, etc., like that. So the two things are linked in De La Salle's mind. But there's meant to be some kind of integral link between these two. We don't really know much about how it was done, except that the text tells us, as regards the five points of the whole of the article to be read during the week, the same order and the same practices indicated with regard to the five reflections of morning prayer are to be kept. So that somehow the afternoon was meant to pick up whatever happened in the morning. Now, we're going to speed through this. This is the origin of the whole thing. But the thing develops. Obviously, the same thing day after day, year after year becomes too much. So the first written material we find is quite a long time after. It's in the 19th century. But what they do then is they bring a whole lot of other topics so that in actual practice there are enough topics now to have a separate topic for each day of the month. That they're still for each day of the month. you find this full text in your, in your book anyhow. And once again, the teacher will explain during the time needed for a good miserere, about three minutes, making the children aware of their obligations in this matter and suggesting <coughs> means and resolutions which they should take to carry out these duties faithfully. Okay, so the thing moves on. At certain stages they say, no, no, we don't use these things anymore. We've got these optional extras and so on like that. There are also for the evening an equal number of articles and reflections which should be read in the same manner. In this way, during each month, the children will have their principal duties presented to them as well as the most usual faults common to their age group. What's interesting about this is that de La Salle writes a whole booklet on how to make a good confession. And it's interesting that the things he brings up in this book of children making a good confession are not about murder, adultery and stealing, you know, from the bank at all, but about the ordinary things you'd expect a child to get, you know, disobeying your parents using bad words, you know, being angry with somebody or hitting somebody. The ordinary little things that go with children. Where did he learn that? Well, remember that at 20 years of age, he comes back from Central Peace and takes charge of his own brothers and sisters. I think he learned a great deal from that period. He became father and mother to them for a couple of years. This can be a great benefit to them, especially if it leads them to develop the good habit of foreseeing each morning the faults that they are most likely to commit during the day and to examine themselves in the evening in the resolutions they had taken. So here's the heritage being developed now in a much broader kind of way, broader themes, but still linking the morning resolution and the afternoon examination as to whether it worked or not. So, we come to the whole tradition of the Institute of having written reflections. I was surprised in writing down the archives of the um, Baltimore district and New York district that very few of them turned up reflection booklets. Every, every district I know in, in Europe, the French, the Spanish, the Italians, every school had their reflection booklets written each year. When I first went out teaching, uh, etc., in a community of 20 brothers, I remember one day, or one evening, a brother came round who was very, said, oh, look, these are my reflections for the next month, if you'd like to make use of any of them. And uh, that was the tradition, that you made up your own or you compiled your own books of them. So this is the particular ones that I found in California, anyhow. 
Okay, and they're, they're interesting. Well, I'll give you the, be able to read the text in a moment. This is typical of many of the reflection booklets produced around the world. The aim was to interest students in something that was part of their ordinary day living. Very often the point was made by a good story which presented its own moral without the need for any prolonged explanation by the teacher. In some ways it was like telling a good joke. If the joke had to be explained, <laughs> there was something wrong with the telling. The tradition was for each by the collector's own set of reflections. But what do they look like if you put them up? Well, here's one. Here's the September one, September the 4th. A good start. Is that all readable for you? I can, it, it was from a very bad copy, but anyhow. Have you ever gone up in an aeroplane or even watched one take off at the airfield? It's dated, of course. If so, you'd probably have noticed the following procedure. After being loaded with passengers, the plane rolls slowly across the field, the field at the beginning of the runway. Then the pilot spins his propellers for all they're worth. <laughs> Don't tell them these days. There is a terrific roar and a great deal of vibration. Satisfied that all is well, the pilot heads the, place, the plane down the runway with plenty of determination. <laughs> Presently, he's in the air. A successful takeoff. To achieve anything in life, worthwhile in life, we have to act likewise. At the beginning of the school year, we need to rouse ourselves to a spirit of determination. We have to start with a great deal of energy and a spirit of resolution. Otherwise, we're like a pilot who tries to... Uh, raise his plane from the ground by a slow, uh, hesitating spin down the runway. Either he never gets off the earth or he rises momentarily and for lack of speed allows his plane to crash. Start this year so that you won't make a failure of it right from the beginning by your lack of determination. And the visual aid for it is an aeroplane. That was part of the reflection itself. Now when you read it like this it sounds corny. Or perhaps worse. But anyhow. But the point is the reflection was never meant to be read. It was to be given. It was to be given. And that was the point. The heart was to speak to the heart. It's so true, it's the most vulnerable thing you're ever going to do. You literally expose yourself and your feelings to people for them to laugh at you, saying, oh dear, oh dear. But it's worth doing. And that's why I think it's one of the very important things which we have to sort of retain. It's, the touching hearts thing is not accidental, not just a kind of needle in a haystack thing. It happens because you're willing to speak from your heart to their hearts in a way that's not domineering, but which lets them see what matters to you. And I point this, that recalling from the conduct of schools that the brother was to avoid anything that suggested preaching, the reflection was always spoken as a story from the heart of the students. It was never read. Now I know that some schools have a common reflection coming through the address system from the principal or somebody, but I still think it's much easier or much more authentic if it's a daily conversation between a teacher and a group. Much more authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the expectation or the hope that this would be a reflection per academic period or would they turn and say this is the domain of the religion department good question and this is your job yes. yes I think somewhere in the text in the third section of the text I say one of the great dangers of separating such interesting words we had last night as faith development religious studies uh, religion da 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 etc is that the group doing these things and doing liturgy are a kind of God squad and other people simply stand on the sidelines and cheer or jeer according to their etc. Seems to me that somewhere in all of this the, the challenge is to invite people in the class which they're responsible for, for which they have pastoral care, to actually at certain time each day or each week say something. When, we re when the French district, the French district, uh, when there were still eight provinces, uh, in 19, when I was director, so some in the 1980s, they challenged 
all their schools to take up the reflection again. And from their Paris base, they sent each school suggested list of reflections for the month. I actually saw in a school, the school of Troyes, T-R-O-Y-E-S, south of Reims, the, on the only school premises where the brothers have been since the founders' time, it's now a technical school. And when the brother principal said to the teachers, you know, um, a group of them got together and I saw a set of reflections which they did on wood. The whole question of the grain of the wood and how you actually, if you're going to work with wood, you've got to see where the knot is. And if you're going to turn it and polish it, you need to do this and this and this. And they, they set up a series of reflections for the whole year uh, around wood, working with wood, working with metal, so on like that. That was, a, I found, a very interesting example. That's where a school adopted it as a policy. Uh, but uh, I think the challenge is to say, well, I mean, I've been in schools, in our own schools in Australia, in schools in England and in Ireland, where I've heard the thing come over the loudspeaker. And, and, and I see kids paying attention and teachers paying attention. It just seems to me that it's not the same thing as when you are prepared to put yourself on the line and speak from the heart to the heart. Um, that is risky. It's risky. Got to be very brave. It's funny how when you grow up with it, I can still remember that I was going into a class where you could actually sit for a state examination which would then give you, the, it would pay then for your whole secondary education. So we were in the fifth grade, but we were taken into the sixth grade to be hotted up for the exam the following year. About ten of us, I think. And indeed, um, uh, during that, that's right, and then, no, this was a Saturday morning, I'm sorry, because this, but this was part of the whole process. And Brother came over, and it was October the 17th, which happened to be, in those days, the Feast of Brother Solomon. And the Brother said to us, uh, well, look, he said, today is, you know, it's, it's not a normal day. We're here ready to, you know, uh, speed up our maths and so on. But I'd like to tell you a story. The brothers today think of a brother who's called Brother Solomon, and he was martyred during the French Revolution. But uh, he was a pupil of the brothers from uh, the school of Bologna, up near Cadet on the English Channel. And he was sent by his father to Rome to learn business methods, so, sorry, to Paris. But he fell in with a crowd of people who didn't go to Mass and used to eat meat on Fridays, which was forbidden in the church and so on like that. And, and he was very unhappy, but he couldn't really do, you know, he wasn't very strong about this. And one day he met in the street in Paris one of the brothers who taught him, who saw that he was a bit downcast and said, well, you know, come and, come and see me. And he came and poured out his heart about, you know, all these things and how he'd been very weak and so on like that. And, and he said, anyhow, he said, I, I don't want to do commercial methods. I want to be a brother. So he went back to his family, got permission, entered became eventually secretary to the brother superior general of the time, the great brother Agathon, and he was the one in the Carmelite Abbey who, with the others, they were asked to sign whether or not they agreed with this idea that in future the state was in charge of everything, including the church. He refused to sign, and like all the others, they were fed down simply a set of stairs to a garden. As they came out the garden door, they were executed. He said the young man who couldn't stand up against his companions eventually died for his faith. I've never forgotten that. Never forgotten it. Did it have an influence in my becoming a brother? I don't know. But I never forgot that that Saturday morning when we'd gone expressly to do more maths, I think it was, that brother thought it was worthwhile telling us that story. And he told it very simply as I've just told it. And I always remembered it. Now it seems to me that that really is, is what the, the, the challenge is. Yes. Brother Garrett, do you think the reflection is, or how, how is the, the frequency of the reflection in schools that would have, where the pupils would have many different teachers, mm. as would be the case, you know, in a high school? Yes. Like, do you think it's best that, you know, seven 
periods a day, every day, a 15-year-old your reflection? I think the, um, the way we did it in, our in Australia anyhow was simply we, we finally decided it was the responsibility of the person in charge of pastoral care. Whoever was in charge of that, uh, we, we, have, we have a sort of a, when a class meets in the morning, the first thing is what they call pastoral care. The teacher meets his class for 15 or 20 minutes before any formal classes begin. Mm. You do something similar? Homeroom, okay, yes. And uh, that's how it was done. Uh, and you, you, talk, you met your group? You met them each day, and you. I gave it every day. I was. Um, I regretted. It was only my very last year of teaching that I decided, because I had a very, very good class. I invited the class that on Fridays one of them would give the reflection. And the first time, two of them gave it together. And then. Uh, what I noticed immediately was they were listened to much more attentively than I was because <laughs> they were prepared to put themselves online. Uh, if I say that out of that group, this is, not, this is the only, not the only criterion one could have used, but if I say that out of that class you know, there came two brothers and three priests, it may have been something about the atmosphere of that class that had its own sort of faith you know, could be spoken about. Um, the tradition is interesting. Like if you look at, here's another example, another September. Don't cheat, study. <laughs> <laughs> There's a radio program called People Are Funny, etc., etc., etc. It's quite noticeable among college students that the, that the major interest is to avoid class and have as many holidays as possible. In other words, they pay for something and they don't want to get what they pay for. Agreed, it's generally presumed that students come to school to learn but there are a few whose main occupation seems to be the deriving of ways and means of fulfilling requirements and gaining credits without opening a book. For this purpose, cheating is in all its various ramifications one of the most common actions employed. To some unthinking minds, this may seem nothing more than harmless sport, a sort of game which the student is pitted against teacher. But as a matter of fact, there could be some serious consequences of this practice. In the first place, etc., etc., and that goes on. Secondly, da-da-da, spoken not read. That was the important thing about it. These were never meant to be read out, they were meant to be thought about and given as individual sort of things. Who made the devils? Who made the angels, he asked. God made the angels. Who made the devils? A little girl raised her hand. Can you tell me who made the who made the devil, the priest asked, yes, God made angels and some of the angels made themselves devils. Then he reflects, the greatest theologians, same thing applies to human beings. After God finished the work, he looked over it and found it was very good, but some have evil will and some have deliberately chosen, da, 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 da. Okay? Simple story and reflect. And it doesn't say, and so, my dear boys, you must always... That sentence in the conduct that says, the brother teaches, he, he's not there as preaching. He's not doing that dreadful wind-up when you just hope the priest will find something to wind up with. Uh, it, in other words, <laughs> it, it, it's very important, very important that the thing be from the heart to the heart, clear, a good story, it reflects who you are, what you did, and so on like that, and uh, etc. The measure of love, etc., etc. And then goes on, etc. This is a very sort of, you know, how much you love God. This is a way of measuring it. Physics and chemistry, da 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 da. Uh, love of God and love are just as inseparable as the two connected tubes. It would be just impossible to love God and not love neighbor, as it would have water in one tube and not in the other. Therefore, love our neighbour is a measure of our love for God. Jesus Christ, in fact, has told us, if you love me, keep my commandments. Da, 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 da. Now, all of these sort of are just meant to illustrate what have been a very important part of your tradition, of the, of the heritage of the Institute. Now, we've lost, we lost the tradition in certain places. We've modified it. And my response to that is not, oh dear, you must go back to the original five reflections. No. 
But where is that particular moment in the day or in the week where you, in terms of who you are and why you're in this school and why you're teaching, etc., where do you communicate what you believe in? That's very, very important. And that is what the reflection was about. And I certainly would think when I say that I don't happen myself, I don't happen to like the idea of it coming through to everybody at the same time. But if that's the only way it can be done, well, far better to do it that way than not have it. That at least some stage of the day, something is said to everybody, etc. I'd like to think it was said and not, and not read. I'd like to think it was something which was done by different groups. I've known, I've known some schools where they do it this way and different classes take responsibility for it. Sometimes preceded by, they might sing something and then they do something based on whatever the song was and some comment on it and then they invite everybody to sing again. There are all sorts of variations on the theme. But it's a very, very important way of actually trying to touch hearts. It, it's so integral to our tradition, to our heritage, uh, I suggest that it's worth thinking, okay. And I don't, I don't in any way discount the difficulty of thinking, well, but isn't this what the God Squad does? Don't we have religion department to do that kind of holy things? Somehow in that whole vision that goes with those first masters, when de La Salle says, well, what do you want to call yourselves? And they said, we're going to call ourselves brothers. But why are you going to call yourselves brothers? Because we want to be brothers to one another and older brothers to the young people. De La Salle didn't tell them that. They told him that's what they wanted to be. To me, having sort of seen schools in all the continents and so on like that, uh, in the most remote places of Asia and Africa, I've often asked myself, what is it about that movement that began in Reims in 1680 that now transcends language, culture, religion, I must have given certainly 12, 14 seminars with Muslim teachers in different countries who choose to teach in our schools. Gender. Why is it that the majority of Lasallian teachers today in the world are women? Why is it that the majority of the women are found in Asia? When the brothers went to Asia in 1852 in Penang and Singapore, they published a prospectus saying, anybody can come to this school. Your religion will not be interfered with. It will be respected. This is one of the most strongest baptizing moments in church history. But the brothers never set out to baptize. Never set out ostensibly to give one gift so as to convert. They were never rice Christians, as somebody once said. You didn't say, well, well, we'll give you, you can come to our school, but you must become a Christian. There's that wonderful story of Brother James Dooley, who was an Irish brother teaching in Asia, caught in the Singapore. He was Irish, and therefore he protested to the Japanese that he should not be imprisoned. He was Irish, not English. He had no war going on. And he protested so hard that eventually, in his white robe, he was put in a line of people who were having their heads cut off. And he's about three from the end, and an officer walking by in uniform, a Japanese officer, says to him in English, are you a priest? And as Jim said, it wasn't a moment for theological distinctions. <laughs> <laughs> so he said yes. And the priest who had done his university studies in Sophia University in Tokyo with the Jesuits, took him out of the line. After various things, Jim ended up as headmaster in St. Joseph's in Hong Kong, our first foundation in Hong, 1864. He's sitting in his office one day when his secretary says, look, look, there's an old man who wants to see you. Well, look, I don't have any appointment, no, is he? Well, look, he's coming in whether you like it or not. And in came this old man leading a very small child by the hand. Sat down heavily, looked at him and said, Brother Director, 
Long before you were born, I was a pupil in this school. But Brother Emile, because the first foundation was French, Brother Emile accepted us, accepted me and my brother. We were very poor. We couldn't pay anything. But he said, don't worry, you come. The school was open to us. But because we received an education, we prospered. And I was able to send my boys to this school, and they prospered. And they have sent their children to this school and they all have prospered. And now I'm bringing you this one and this one will become a Christian. And Jim says, no, no, it doesn't work like that. Brother Director, we have been watching the brothers ever since they first came. We were always waiting to see whether you were giving us one gift provided we would accept to become Christian. But you always respected us. What you have, the gift you have, must be something we don't have. This child wants, will become a Christian. Brothers didn't convert, but they changed, they converted hearts. Remember being on the Penang race course when we commemorated the 140 years of the brothers in Malaysia. 7,000 people sat down to eat at the same time. And the Chief Justice of Malaysia, a Buddhist, got up and said, I think I may be one of the first Buddhist pupils of the brothers, but I'm a better Buddhist because I went to the brothers. Simple, etc. Somewhere in this whole thing, the touching hearts thing, speaking to the heart, the willingness to share faith, not just through the knowledge in books and a good explanation and so on, there's something deeper that's part of the Lasallian heritage. And it is, you write it, it's risky. You're vulnerable by doing this. But if that's not being done, then we can be running simply, I think, a good, good high school, good school, good exam results. There's something more to it than that. And the challenge, I think, is to see, well, how do we do that? Well, that's part of tomorrow. So um, I'll come back to this because uh, we've, we've come to time. We've told, no time to finish again. We're to finish at... Um, twelve ten. I have five minutes. Um, well, let me just finish a bit because that'll take us into, into tomorrow very well. I've spoken already about the French, uh, the French definition of, of catechesis in the post-war period, the most important definition since the Council of Trent. What we're do talking about is the education of faith. The education of faith not the way in which we actually trick you into believing, but the way we educate you through your mind, through your understanding as to what your faith commits you to. So it's the education of your faith you received in baptism, but it's also education of the faith of the Catholic Church, those great mysteries that Dolisal talked about. And therefore, what's this mean? Well, it's to develop the faith received in baptism. What's it about? It's about doctrine, liturgy, Bible, witness under the guidance of the church. It's about the teacher and the catechist as a fellow believer, faithful to God, faithful to man in that anthropological sense of man, faithful to human beings as they are, faithful to both. So you don't indoctrinate. Because indoctrination gives short-term satisfaction and long-term nothing. And that's the great tragedy, I think, where religious education is shoved onto people or given to them like force-feeding of animals. That's not what it's about. It's about educating them. It's about understanding why. It's living with doubt. It's all those things. Otherwise, it's not authentic. And the assumption is that all this takes place in a dialogue of faith. Dialogue implies more than one speaker. Religion is not just about your questions. It's about their questions too. If they can't ask you questions, if they can't raise difficulties, look out because it looks like one-way transmission there. It's about a sharing of faith through prayer, sacraments, liturgy, paraliturgy, through life, everything that you're with these people for. That's what's important. How interesting that when Pope Paul VI followed John the Twenty-Third. 
he wrote his first encyclical to the council because the council was going on, Vatican Council too. His document was a document on the church. It has 120 paragraphs and 60 paragraphs are about the word dialogue. Paul VI is elected after the first stage of the council. He's required to take the council on, along with all the other bishops. What does he see as the most important word? It's the dialogue with the modern world. It's not the locking us up and keeping that bad world out there somewhere. No, it's about being part of this world and making it better because we have the Christian message. And that's very important. And therefore I think it's important... The great document of, is the document on religious freedom that your great Jesuit John Courtney Murray contributed to. And that wonderful sentence, this is from paragraph, if you look at paragraph 3, 9 and 10. The act of faith by its very nature is a free act. But therefore nobody is to be forced to embrace the faith against his own will. This synod forbids every act of coercion in religious matters. Every act of coercion in religious matters. There are very powerful implications of that. So there's a class mass on, or a school mass on. What about the boy or girl who says, I don't want to go? You've got to go. It's a Catholic school. You're here. You've got to go. Why? Because you get heaps of grace. I'm not sure about that. How, how free is free? Every act of coercion. How interesting that the church has always said, Oremus, let us pray. Not pray. <laughs> let us pray. We're invited. We can say yes and say no. We invite you to celebrate the Eucharist. We invite, let, let's, let's, let's have this, let's prepare, let's, etc., etc. Anyhow, more of that tomorrow. That is one of the great unread documents of the church. And just to finish with the other side, Religious education or education in religion. Religion is a distinct form of thought and experience which cannot be assumed in any other such form. Just as maths can't be anything else but maths. Yes, we use it in physics, but physics is physics and math is math. It can express itself through history, literature, music, philosophy, dancing, but it's still religion. It finds different forms of expression. See, it's like the person saying, do you believe in baptism? Why, I've even seen it done. <laughs> See what I mean? It's, it's very important to sort of... I'll just hurry through this because, well, this is necessary to pick it up again in another sense. But You see, if you say, we've got all the truth, I'm going to teach you what you've got to know, this is teaching that this is what you have to do. Now, if you said, well, look, I'll teach you how how Hindus actually perform their sacred. If you learn about that, that's very interesting. That's folkloric. It doesn't necessarily say to you, and therefore you now become a Hindu. I will teach you why Muslims pray five times a day. Does that make you a Muslim, if you know that? No. Does it make you better? It may make you say, well, the school where I'm in, or the community I'm in, we've got a school of 500 next door, 30 of the 500 boys are Muslim. At the start of Ramadan, the IRE teacher sends the year 10 boys around the school to explain to all the others why they're fasting. So one of the first questions they always get is, Miss, Miss, do we have fasting in the Catholic Church? Yes, you have Lent. What's Lent? Anyhow, anyhow that's another story. So... So there are various, the position you take as a teacher, to teach that dogmatically, teach how people, why, they're very different things. They give you knowledge and understanding. They don't commit you to belief, though. So that educating in all these things is part of our humanness. You can do all these things. Religious education can exist quite apart from anything catechetical. And part of what you do in religious studies has necessary to be the objective study of this, the objective study of why people do this and so on. You don't do it to convert. 
you get it's a question of knowledge and understanding. And so this distinction between what is faith speaking to faith, or faith speaking to doubt, and the education in a broader sense are complementary things. They're both important. One's important level of knowledge, another is very important at a level of faith. We do both those things, I hope, in our schools. Okay, that takes us then. So that's, uh, I know it's a big background, and the way I've written the book, I think you will see that that's the kind of necessary background so that when you come now, as we come in this afternoon, sorry, tomorrow morning, we'll try and look, well, what happened when the brothers came to the States? What was the heritage that they leave us? And what are the challenges for us today? It's against that background that we want to sort of develop everything.